Well, good morning, everyone. Thank you for attending our panel here. We have Professor Richard Vetter from Ohio University, and he has a very long uh, CV, but I'm going to give you the, the high points. <laughs> He's Distinguished Emeritus Professor of Economics at Ohio University. He received his PhD in Economics from the University of Illinois. He's the founding director of the Center for College Affordability and Productivity. He was a senior economist at the U.S. Joint Economic Committee. Rich has written hundreds of articles and reviews which have appeared in the Wall Street Journal, the Chronicle of Higher Ed, Forbes, the Washington Times, Investors Business Daily, and on and on. He's been interviewed on Fox News, on Fox Business Network, on Fox Nation, on C-SPAN, ABC, you get the picture. Uh, uh, Rich Vetter is perhaps the preeminent conservative higher ed analyst in the country today, and it's a real honor to have him here. Please, please join me in welcoming him. <laughs> Well, thanks, thanks, uh, Tom. You don't have to pick up my stuff, Rich. Yeah, so. yes, I do. <laughs> After that glowing introduction, which was much undeserved, uh, uh, I am uh, an ancient guy, and I've been around a long time. This fall, I will be teaching a course in American economic history for the 55th year in a row, um, which doesn't happen very much. In fact, I've been teaching it so long that about a third of the history that I teach didn't exist when I started teaching because it hadn't happened yet. Uh, uh, first, I was a standard academic writing stuff on the economics of slavery, on migration, immigration, topics like that as an economic historian. Until in the late 90s, someone at the Wall Street Journal, which I did write for quite a bit, asked me, do well, you want to write something kind of clever for something we have called Manager's Journal, a little column for managers? And I said, yeah, I'll write something about the most peculiar uh, uh, business organization in the world, namely American Higher Ed. <laughs> so I, I wrote a piece and said, you know, American Higher Ed is today's peculiar institution. That was a term used to describe slavery in the 19th century. Today's peculiar institution is higher ed. The words are even different. An hour for most of you means 60 minutes. And higher ed, an hour, 50 minutes. A year is 52 weeks for you. In higher ed, it's, well, it used to be 32, 33. It's kind of down to about 30 weeks now, uh, the academic year. Most places in the world, Employees are hired by employers, and the employers fire the employees if they do poorly. In a higher ed, it has been known that the reverse happens. The employers hire the employees, but the employees get mad at the employers, so they fire them. And you say, that never happens. Think of Larry Summers, who's not my most favorite individual, by the way who was fired as president of Harvard University in 2005 because he made a statement which was politically incorrect. Namely, he says, I think on balance, you know, there are gender differences between people. Each gender has its strengths and weaknesses. I think men probably still have a slight edge over women in mathematics. Oh, my God. The world had came to an end. Uh, whether he was right or not on the empirical issue is another issue. But the point is... Higher ed is weird in many ways. It's different, anyway. So uh, three years, I so that led to Georgia Allen, who was governor of Virginia, inviting me into Virginia to speak to the board of uh, visitors, as they call it. Here it would be board of regents of all the uh, Virginia schools about higher ed in America. So I took a little 800-word thing uh, that I wrote for the journal and made it into a little longer, 20 minute, 30 minute speech. And then Columbia University called and asked, said we're having a conference on such and such. Can you make that into even a more substantial thing? So I made it into an hour thing. And I said, the hell with this. I'll do what I do best. I'll write books that no one reads. <laughs> uh, uh, so I wrote a book uh, called Going Broke by Degree. Why Higher ed Education Costs Too Much. 
in 2004. Well, that led to one thing and another. I got invited to the White House for some meeting. In fact, ironically, in the room was uh, where I was was Karl Rove at the time. And uh, this guy named Jim Pearson, he was a very prominent person. Tom knows him, very uh, distinguished both scholar and philanthropy leader. Uh, the president of the William Simon Foundation, used to be the John Olin Foundation, said, you ought to start a think tank, you know, uh, and we, you can, we can get you a lot of money. And coming from a guy who raises a lot of money, I said, sure. So I turned around, I got the support of the Cyril Freedom Trust, uh, Kim Dennis, and so I started a think tank, which I ran for years. So I went into the higher ed business. Then a Texan, who I never had met in my life, named Margaret Spellings, uh, somehow heard about me uh, and was told, directed to put me on a commission she had created on the future of higher ed. So I served on the Spellings Commission for a year, which my wife told me, you're wasting a year of your life. She was right, but as she usually is, but I had a lot of fun doing it. I uh, you know, got to go meet a lot of interesting people and I went to dinner with Sally Ride one night and I asked, what do you do for a living? Uh, the dumbest thing I ever said in my whole life. So anyway, so I've been doing this higher ed thing. So, uh, but 15 years have passed since I wrote this earlier book a lot of things have happened in higher ed in the last 15 years, and I says it's time for me to revisit it. And so I re have revisited not only the economics of higher ed, which is still a large part of my emphasis, but the other peculiarities of higher ed. I've looked at issues such as academic freedom, which is I never thought would be an issue again in higher ed, but it has become very much so. And the right to express oneself uh, uh, sort of without concern of retribution. Uh, and I've looked at other issues as well. Intercollegiate athletics has become much more of an issue than it was 15 years. It was an issue 15 years ago, but it's grown in importance. And a whole variety of other issues like that. So I wrote this new book, which has just come out. And then um, uh, Tom invited me here, and I view Texas as kind of a second home because I've been involved with TPP, TPPF since day, almost since day one. T Tommy Eflin is kind of laughing because I was at the very first of the, uh, what do you call it, orientation sessions. Driscoll, wasn't it, probably? And I remember when the headquarters were in San Antonio, Jeff Judson was the head of it, wait, prior to Brooke Rollins. So I, I, I loved uh, uh, TPPF uh, for a long time, and uh, so I was delighted to be here. So that's too long of an introduction. Go ahead. Thanks, Rich. And I uh, point out here that we have copies of the book, Restoring the Promise, and will be available for sale and also for signing by Rich after uh, we conclude this. Rich, I want to uh, call the audience's attention to a very uh, striking conclusion you reach, and I want to find out how you reached it. You assert in the book that tuition fees today at American universities would be only about half of what they actually are if federal student financial assistance programs had not been invented. How did you come to that conclusion? Well, there's different ways you can reach that conclusion. It's the truth, <laughs> so that's that. Uh, no, here's a simple way you could do it. Look at what happened to tuition fees in America from way, way back when. I have data, the tuition at Harvard College in 1840 was $60. So what is that, what from 1840 to say the late 1970s, tuition fees at Harvard and many, many other schools rose a little more than the overall inflation rate. Higher ed is a labor-intensive activity. It has been viewed difficult to get productivity advance there. We, um, you know, with the possible uh, exception of prostitution, 
I know of no profession that has had absolutely no productivity advance uh, <laughs> other than t in, in teaching uh, in the 2400 years <laughs> since Socrates taught the youth of Athens. It's very difficult to improve productivity when you get up in front of an audience like this. But, so we had 1% price inflation. Uh, and since 1978, you don't mind if I use fingers, they're not paying me any money, so I didn't do a PowerPoint. Uh, with this, of where I'm from, we call this West Virginia PowerPoint. Here it'd probably be Oklahoma PowerPoint. Uh, 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 I'll use my fingers. Uh, three we went from 1% inflation to 3% uh, inflation in tuition fees, adjusting for the overall inflation rate. So what does that mean? Well, calculate what a 1% growth in fees would be compared with a 3% growth over 40 years. Fees today would be half of what they actually are. So at UT, what's the in-state fee? 11,000 maybe, probably. Does anyone know? I think in the 10, 12,000 range. It would instead be 5,000 or 6,000. Uh, and if the fees were 5,000 at UT, we wouldn't be having quite all these fights, concerns about student loans and all that. People wouldn't need to borrow so much if the fees were low, if the fees were low. When I started teaching at my school, the tuition fee for a year was $450. That is $3,500 in today's dollars. The actual fee where I am is $12,000, over three times as much. And that's pretty much what's happened all over the country. Uh, and so Bill Bennett, Secretary of Education, 1978, wrote in a book, uh, wrote in the New York Times of all places, 1987, he said this. He says, well, colleges, now that we have these government uh, financial aid programs, you can just go out and borrow the money, colleges can become much more aggressive in raising their fees. So they have. They have. And there are studies by the New York Federal Reserve Bank, by the National Bureau of Economic Research, by a whole variety of people doing very careful work that says about two-thirds almost of the gains from higher fees do not accrue to the students in the form of lower what they actually pay, but actually go to the colleges themselves. The colleges raise tuition, uh, tuition fees by about two-thirds of whatever the uh, uh, per dollar amount that the students borrow. So the real winners are the universities. And the universities have started an academic arms race with this money, and it has caused all sorts of problems. And I could go into that, but uh, we will never get out of here if I don't let Tom answer another question. So the trouble is, us professors, we have tenure, we speak in 50 minute sound bites. We are absolutely horrible at controlling time wise, so I'll try to <laughs> constrain myself there. Thank you. Assume for just a moment that there are no political constraints to deal with. How, under those ideal conditions, would you modify student financial aid programs? I, if, a, if I were czar, I would, uh, after I sent AOC off to a penal colony in Australia, <laughs> or something, uh, I would probably, well, I would do away with the federal programs. i just do away with them. I might take two years, three years, I, you know, there is a transition. And you know, Plato said in the Republic, necessity is the mother of invention. It's amazing how the private enterprise sector can rise to meet any challenge. And they would meet the challenge. There would be an expansion of private student loan programs. There would be new forms of, of ways of financing higher ed. We can talk about some of those income share agreements, et cetera. There would be all sorts of ways we would find to meet those needs. And it might end up, it would cost a little more to the students to borrow in, in one sense. The interest rates might be a little higher, for example. 
uh, this forbearance and all the stuff we have right now would go by the wayside, all this uh, uh, stuff that went in, in the, mostly in the Obama years. Uh, but, and we might end up having fewer kids go to college. I think that would be great. Too many kids go to college now. Not, now, that doesn't mean too many. I'm not against education. I don't want to, I have never burned a book. Uh, I want kids to learn. I want people to learn. But there are other ways to learn besides going to four-year colleges. And too many kids go to school that don't belong. So uh, uh, I think we ought to do away with the system. Now, there are, that's not going to happen. So, you know, we, I can give you a second best solution or we can go on to answer some other question, whatever you want. Well, one of the solutions that's been proposed, for example, by Senator Lamar Alexander is a skin in the game provision. Skin in the game is a good idea. Uh, that means the college, after all, the reason why we have so many kids run up these debts are the colleges accept these kids in the first place. And when the colleges accept these kids, the colleges are making a commitment for the federal government. They're investing the federal government's money, in effect. And if the kids don't graduate, uh, the taxpayer is on the hook if, if they don't repay the loan, which they don't usually. Let's take a school, uh, I, I was tempted to pick on some Texas institutions, but I, I don't know, that might be, might hurt some of you. Some of you look fairly young and you probably, you know, can't take the pain <laughs> of my saying something disrupt that would hurt you or raise your blood pressure by a little bit. So let me use an example from Chicago. Let's go to Chicago. How, what percentage of the students going to Chicago State University graduate? According to the US government, it's a college scorecard, you get it right off your phone, 15%. For everyone who graduates, there's six who do not. What's the average earnings after attending Chicago State University? A little under $34,000 a year, <laughs> or about 650 bucks a week, or about $16 an hour if you were working full time. And my guess is a high school uh, a student who was reasonably diligent, who stayed on a job for a year, would probably get up to 16 bucks an hour in Chicago, because uh, the wages tend to be pretty high there. So, in other words, why do we even allow this institution to exist? No one graduates. Oh, uh, a large majority of the students within three years of leaving have not paid one penny on their student loans. One penny. So, what Lamar Alexander is saying is, this shouldn't be allowed to happen. Or if they persist in taking kids that they know are almost certainly going to fail, if they can't use remediation and all to get them up to a level where they can pass, then the school ought to pay some consequences of the federal government assuming all this debt that happens when these kids drop out. The kids are left without a degree. They're a lot having a debt. They think themselves, psychologically, they think themselves sort of failures in life. All of this is bad. Why do we allow this to happen? Well, let's make the school pay something, pay part of that back. So that's what uh, Alexander saying. I think it's a good idea. Uh, I do too. One of the things that you hear in opposition to it is that this will lead the universities to cherry pick. Yeah, you mean, in, yeah, I agree. You, you mean they pick students that are competent over students who are incompetent? <laughs> yeah, I'm great. I believe in cherry picking. I, we need more cherry picking. We don't do enough in America. We need to reward merit. We need to reward excellence. That's what this country was built on, excellence. 
reward, hard work. We didn't have an aristocracy here. We don't have, you got ahead not because your father was a duke or an earl, you got ahead because you worked hard. And we have let that slide some in higher ed, and we see it in a whole variety of ways. You probably ask me about, I don't know, great inflation later on. Uh, another one of my pet peeves. Um, yes, uh, let's cherry pick. I'm all for cherry picking. Uh, you, you make another strong claim in the book that virtually every major university in the country could get rid of 20% of its administrative staff without any decline in quality in any area. Yeah. <laughs> Does that surprise you? <laughs> Why is you, it you were a president of a college <laughs> once, Tom. You ought to know better than to ask me that question. <laughs> Actually, that's unfair. I put him up to ask him that question. <laughs> uh, uh, absolutely. Uh, if the number is 10%, 20 30 we, we, we can quibble about that. Um, I'll just take my university, and I think very typical. Uh, the statistics very much mirror the national average. We actually kept pretty good records on the number of administrators in a consistent way from the mid-70s to the present. So in 1974, for every faculty member, this is hard to do and hold a mic, one administrator, two faculty members. Today, there are more administrators, we'll say three, for the two faculty members. So we have things that we don't have. The University of Michigan, wonderful school, viewed as one of the five or so greatest public universities in the United States by everyone, has 93 people who are diversity and inclusion coordinators. Now, I don't know, I'm off, for, we need to open universities up to anyone and everyone, regardless of race, uh, uh, gender, uh, sexual orientation, uh, whatever, how they look. But do we need 93 people to examine that? 93 people at a cost of $14 million more than 25 of whom made over $100,000 a year. How many were there 50 years ago? Zero. $14 million, there's 40,000 students in the Ann Arbor campus of the University of Michigan. Uh, you could cut tuition by 350 bucks if you got rid of all of them. I say let them keep 10 of them. And you know, I, the professors, by the way, are not racially biased anymore uh, 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 against minority groups au contraire, on average. There are maybe a few exceptions, but uh, au contraire, if anything, it's the other way around. So we, we, we need to, this, we don't need a massive amount of, uh, of uh, people to do this. Do we need 30 uh, public relations specialists or 40? Can't we get by with five or 10? You know, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. And this is crowding out academic functions. This is crowding out the people run, the used to be universities were run by the faculty. Now the universities are run by these low level, uh, low IQ uh, bureaucrat. Not, they're not all low IQ. But their salary divided by the IQ is very, very high. <laughs> All right. You've mentioned uh, universities' commitment to what they call diversity a number of times here, but at the same time, they seem often to suppress the diversity of, of ideas. Isn't that the case today? Absolutely. What can, what can we do about that? What can we do? Uh, we certainly need to change it. Now, this is a difficult one. Uh, Tom and I attended a meeting at the White House, when was it, a month ago, six weeks ago, where President Trump signed an executive order on academic freedom, among, uh, roughly speaking. Wouldn't you say that's a rough characterization of what it was about? And I said, right on, President Trump, good idea. But I do worry a little bit, and uh, 
I don't want the government monitoring that too much. I worry, I can just see UT, vice provost in charge of, of intellectual diversity and inclusion as opposed to racial diversity and inclusion, gender diversity and inclusion, other kinds. So I worry a little bit about it. But I do think we need to move in the direction of promoting that. Uh, the University of Chicago, it's not perfect. I would do it maybe a little differently, but if every school in the United States did what the University of Chicago did, we'd be a lot better off than we are. The University of Chicago said, that in the, what now we call the Chicago Principles, and there's some other good schools that have adopted this, Princeton has, uh, Wisconsin has, Purdue has. Um, people can say whatever they want, period, uh, as long as it doesn't endanger anyone or blow up the place or anything. We, we, want people, we want people to be a little bit uncomfortable. We don't want to suppress speech because someone is offended by it or someone feels uncomfortable about it. Au contraire, not the second time I've said that today, you're going to think I'm French. Uh, uh, we want people to be able to express what they think, and we want lively discussion and debate. The way you learn is to confront alternative, uncomfortable ideas and decide which ones we accept, which ones we reject, and evaluate them accordingly. That's what we want. And so if the Chicago principles were adopted, uh, it would be great. Should the state of Texas force the Texas universities to adopt the Chicago principles? That's an, kind of a close call in my judgment. On the one hand, I say yes, but on the other hand, I think about the Texas legislature and Texas state government. Do I really want those clowns? Uh, no offense, Tommy, you used to be one of them. Uh, do I want these people? Uh, uh, getting too involved, it's a, it's a close call. Uh, Clayton Christensen at Harvard has written for the last few years that in the next 20, 30 years, is thousands of colleges could go bankrupt. What do you think about that prediction? I, I think it's just a question of the number we're talking about. He's absolutely right. I mean, they're starting to go already. Uh, New England. The schools are dropping like flies in New England. Green Mountain College, they're dropping like flies in Vermont. Well, that, you know, why should anyone go to school in Vermont? Uh, particularly in Burlington where the, the most famous, their best mayor was Bernie Sanders. Uh, but, uh, no, because of pop, we're having a birth dearth right now. Uh, the number of people between the ages of 18 and 22 in the Midwest and in the Northeast will be 25%, 20-25% less in the mid, middle of the next decade than now, and already enrollments are falling. For eight years in a row in the United States, according to the National Student Clearinghouse, enrollments have fallen. Eight years in a row. Total enrollments. Um, uh, enrollments have fallen at for-profit schools, big time, uh, because they've been harassed a lot by the Obama year, in the Obama years. They've fallen, however, in other categories, community colleges, they've fallen even in four-year schools. And that rate is continuing. All indication is it's going to fall this fall. In Texas, you get a, you, it's a little different because you have a, a growing population. You have in-migration into the state. Uh, you have uh, a little bit higher birth rate, uh, et cetera, all of which is mitigating that. But even in Texas, you're going to start uh, seeing it. I think some Texas schools are going to be in trouble in the next 10 years. 
I don't know if it's going to be in the thousands. It's certainly going to be in the hundreds that go uh, off. But you know, here, oh, here's, here, here, let me put it this way. Creative destruction is what Joseph Schumpeter says is the essence of capitalism. Capitalism succeeds because some people die. Some organizations die. They go belly, belly up. Eastman Kodak is still in existence, barely, barely. 25 years ago, it was one of the top 25 companies in the United States. It invested in the wrong technology, so they went bankrupt. Meanwhile, Google and Amazon, all these others, people are making tens of billions of dollars. So there are rich rewards, and, but there are also catastrophic penalties for failure. What about higher ed? Well, I looked up who the top 25 universities, according to US News and World Report, were in the year 2005. Then I looked up the same list for the year 2018. Guess what? Uh, actually, it was top 20. 19, uh, the only change in the top 20 was Emory moved down a little bit, and uh, someone else, I can't remember, Vanderbilt, someone moved up. 19, almost no change in the top 20. No one dies in higher ed, hardly ever. Be because the government is there to bail you out. The government is there to, to help. And we have tuition tax credits, and we have plus loans, and we have all kinds of special endowment uh, privileges. Universities don't pay capital gains. You and I pay capital gains. Don't you think the University of Texas has made some of their 20-some billion dollars off capital gains? You can be darn well sure of that. And so we treat universities as privileged people in our society, or privileged organizations. But in doing that, we insulate them against the positive dimensions of creative destruction. Some schools should die because they're not providing what human beings want. And there are some schools here in Texas that ought to die. The graduation rates of some, even UT schools, I won't mention names, but you know who they are, are pretty low, pretty low. And the and, and same for other uh, schools as well. Uh, we should let more death occur in higher ed. I am for higher ed deaths. <laughs> so the only time I've ever got applause for promoting death. <laughs> We're hearing from uh, all the Democrats that are running for president and also from a number of Republicans that we need to, quote, invest more in higher education, unquote. But you argue in your book that we are, in fact, overinvested. Would you explain what you mean? Well, too many people are going to college. What's, what does the uh, uh, New York Federal Reserve tell us the underemployment rate is among recent college graduates? What is it? Do you know? 40, it's over 40%. That is, of recent college graduates, over 40% are underemployed. Now, what does that mean? They're in jobs that are typically filled by high school grads. They're doing things like working at Walmart or at Starbucks uh, or their home health care aides, or maybe they're working on a construction project just digging ditches or something. They're doing jobs that don't require a college education. 40%, 40%. Uh, to me, that's a sign that maybe and you'll say, we'll say, well, kids when they graduate from college take a while to transition into a, a real job. And that's true, some do. But even after 10 years after graduation, 20, 30 percent are in that category. We, now I don't have anything against a person going and getting a PhD 
and uh, washing dishes for the rest of their lives. Read books and wash dishes. You know, read Chaucer at night and wash dishes during the day. Uh, that's wonderful. But you can't ask society to pay for it. We, are, we have trillion dollar budget deficits right now. Our nation is going to hell, fiscally to hell. We are, I'm surprised we haven't been downrated more by uh, Moody's and uh, Standard & Poor's. I think we're in for a bad, bad, bad future. These young people here, I feel sorry for them. Uh, I really do. I look at a gentleman smiling at me. He won't be smiling long. He'll be, it'll be, life is going to be like one big hemorrhoid operation for you. <laughs> uh, and uh, unless we change our ways. And so we have to be cautious how we invest. And that means we need to rethink what we're doing in higher ed. We are over-invested. When 40% of the kids can't graduate, when of the 60% out of the 100, you start with 100, 60 graduate, 40 don't, because of dropout rates of 40%. The 60 graduate, 40% of them are underemployed. That leaves you 36 out of the original 100 get jobs, which are typically the kind of jobs that college graduates get. That's too low. And so that may mean we have too many kids going to college. You mentioned grade inflation earlier. Uh, would you like to tell the audience the situation? In nine, when I was a boy, when I was a boy, when I was back, Abraham Lincoln and I used to study together <laughs> back in the old days under some sort of lamp. I forgot what we used in those days. Uh, no, when I started, when I was an undergraduate student, the typical grade point average in an American university on a four point system was about a 2.4, 2.5. That is to say, half B's, half C's. And for freshmen, it often was a little lower than that, maybe 2.1, 2.2. For juniors and seniors, it might be 2.8, 2.9. That would have been a typical experience in the 1950s or 60s. Uh, today, the average grade point average in the United States for the country as a whole is well above a three point, about a 3.1. So you say, so what? So we're giving more B pluses and Bs and fewer Cs than we used to. And we're even giving a lot more As than we used to. So what, big deal. Well, it is a big deal. Because if you were a student uh, attending an American university, one thing that incentivizes you to work is you want to look good when you graduate. You want to have a good record. Your parents will yell at you if you don't. You won't get a job, et cetera. You worry about those things. In 1960, the average American college student spent 40 hours a week studying or going to school, going to class, doing academic things, studying, writing papers, reading, going to class. They work like other Americans, 40 hours a week. Today, the average is 27, 27 hours a week. How many weeks a year does a college student go to school? I'm asking you. 30. 15 week semesters, two semesters. Is that about right? I mean, close to right. Uh, even in this day of uh, lower math skills, maybe, you can do the math. 30 times 27 is 810, 810. So here we have kids going to school 810 hours a year, or working on school projects. Their brothers and sisters in seventh and eighth grade are spending more time in school. Their parents who are working to support them are working 1,600, 1,800, 2,000 hours a year, each, maybe two of them. We have an enormous underutilization of human resources, and it is prompted at least in part by grade inflation. If you 
mandated that, that the, no university could have a, a cumulative GPA for its students above 2.8 or something, just pick any number you want, but lower than what we have now. It would cost zero to almost zero to implement that, and it would have untold positive effects. I don't want the federal government telling uh, private schools, although there's no such thing as a private school except for Hillsdale, in Grove City, about there's about three private schools in the United States. Harvard, you know, how much money does Harvard University get from the federal government per student? Almost a hundred thousand dollars, more than UT does. Harvard is a public school, masquerading as a private school. Where do they get the money? Government research grants, mainly but also tuition tax preferences. Uh, they're huge, they're absolutely mammoth. So they put in an endowment tax recently, 2017. God, you thought the world had come to the end in the Ivies. Harvard's gonna have to pay 20 or $30 million in taxes this year because they have to pay taxes of one, about one and a half percent roughly on their endowment earnings, uh, you thought the world had come to an end. The world as we know it has come to an end. Oh, get real, folks. Anyway, I got way beyond tuition. Well, at a time here when there are so many bad news stories about higher ed across the country, we also have Mitch Daniels at Purdue, who has been spectacularly successful on all fronts. Learning quality, uh, student loans, uh, freezing tuition. How do you account for his success? Mitch Daniels, it's, it's interesting. The really successful university presidents um, are a mixed bag. There are very few of them. There are some, though. Mitch Daniels is one of those unusual individuals who spent a third of his life in business, in business. Eli Lilly, ever hear of Eli Will Lilly? He was a vice president, high-ranking official at Eli Lilly. One third of his time in government as an official, including governor of Indiana for two terms. And, the, and now he's a, a university administrator. It's a perfect combination, really, in many ways. He's seen the world. And there are a few other presidents who have uh, sort of an entrepreneurial spirit. But university presidents don't want to be entrepreneurs. They, they don't, they're risk averse. They want to avoid risk. So they do things that will maximize their continuing to get an employment contract. So they try to make their trustees or regents happy. So Bill Powers, uh, should I say this? Yeah, I'll say it. What the, yeah, I, I shouldn't pick on him. He's deceased. But Bill Powers and others like him, what's an admiral or general or whatever his name is, Raven, and uh, John Sharp down at A&M. You want me to bring A&M in? I know Brooke Rollins always insisted you use A&M as an example. Uh, uh, or even, God forbid, the University of Houston or Texas Tech. Uh, North Texas State Bar and Grill, whatever the name of it is. Uh, uh, so these, you know, it, it's disgraceful uh, what what's these people are not doing uh, in their administration of their universities. Mitch Daniels said. Let's keep costs down. So he let a bunch of administrators go. <gasps> what happened? Applications are up. Enrollments are up. The school is booming. Uh, Mitch Daniels said, uh, we want to let, let us start investing in our own students. Let us have some skin in the game. So let's start income share agreements where we invest in our students and we uh, pay their tuition for them while they're in school, but make them pay us back afterwards a share of their income for a few years. If those kids do well, 
We'll do well, Purdue will do well. If the kids do poorly, we'll lose. So we have skin in the game. It is an our advantage to have these people succeed in life. Great idea. Why don't others do it? Because there's no, they don't feel the need to do it. There's no incentives. They got their boards of trustees or board of regents around their fingers. Uh, uh, Bill Powers had the board of regents of UT around their fingers, except for Wallace Hall and Brenda Pavich and one or two others. Uh, the same is true. Probably John Sharp has them around the wall, and they know. You know they buy them off. I was telling uh, Tom. I should I say this? Wallace, uh, I had said something nasty about A and M, and I here I am living in Ohio. So John uh, Tech at, at UT, when you say something nasty about you, what they do is they go after you. So they they went after me. They, they did a public records request for all my emails back from the beginning of time. Uh, uh, they didn't believe that in 1842 when I was born they didn't have email. Uh, uh, and I, I'm not making this up, this is true. Uh, Sharp did a, had a different approach and I loved it, I must say. For him. He called me up and said, this was when Johnny Menzel was playing, remember? Mr. Football, he called me up and said, you want to come down to the, what was it, Alabama A&M game or whatever? He said, stay with whatever his wife's name is and me at the house and, you know, I'll put you up and we'll wine and dine you for two or three days. And I thought, my God, I'm being bribed by a university president. <laughs> my biggest mistake is I refused it. I don't know why I didn't do it. No. University presidents do not have enough incentives of the right kind to want to be entrepreneurial in a good sort of way. There are some interesting presidents. Gordon Gee is one of the most interesting guys I've ever met. Am I being cut off? Uh, oh, okay, I thought I was being, <laughs> I'm being censored for some, <laughs> something I said. <laughs> um, by the way, I, I no, I promised Tom I wouldn't talk about censorship at TPPF. I won't. Uh, so, uh, but we don't have enough entrepreneurs in higher ed. We really don't. We don't have enough people thinking imaginatively. The accreditation organizations are part of the reason. They force people to conform to a certain model. You, new innovations in higher ed are discouraged. So far, I notice people are getting up ready to leave, so I think I probably have gone farther than I should, or longer than I should, so uh, uh, I will. We'll now turn it over to Q&A. Yeah. Any anyone, questions? Anyone who has questions here? There are several questions, Tom, you, you, you take Here's charge. Here. Go ahead, sir. What about efficiency of faculty? Oh, I'm shocked you raised that. Oh my God, I'm glad you raised that. When I started teaching at my university, it hasn't changed a bit, in, it's changed some. The kids have longer hair now. Uh, they don't work as hard, they drink more. They do other things a little more than they used to. Although that seemed impossible, but they do. Uh, uh, when I started teaching, I taught three courses a semester at my university. Two semesters a year, that's six courses. What do my colleagues, same department, teaching the same kind of courses teach today? Two courses a semester, four a year. Why? Oh, we're doing cutting edge research. For whom? <laughs> Who reads it? You know, over a 20-year period, uh, Mark Bauerlein at Emory, great English professor at Emory University, counted the number of papers written in academic journals on William Shakespeare. William Shakespeare was a cool dude. He was a great guy, probably the greatest wordsmith in the English language. He deserves to be studied, no question. Do we need one? thousand papers a year 
on William Shakespeare. That's three a day. Do we every eight hours need a new insight on William Shakespeare? Is there that much that can be said about the guy? The dude died 400 years ago. So I think we have a problem there. Faculty productivity is low. It is misplaced more than anything else. I think faculty should do more teaching. I really do. And does that mean Nobel Prize winners who are really geniuses at discovering things should be teaching eight hours? No, probably not. Does it mean that someone at North Texas State who has a mediocre research record maybe shouldn't even teach four courses uh, a semester? Maybe. We should. We aren't doing enough teaching. There's no question about it. Who's next? Yes, sir, go ahead. Yes, although I haven't actually finished your book, it's uh, absolutely the best book I've read on higher education and since Prof Scam, and that's over 30 years ago. Uh, I tip my hat to you. Well, thank you. you. And, um, You're actually reading my book? <laughs> <laughs> I want that's your autograph. You. Yeah, I'll... <laughs> Well, I'll autograph your book if you'll uh, autograph mine. Thank you. I just hope that what Rachel Carson's Silent Spring did for the environmental movement, your book will do for higher education. But my question has to do with uh, conservatism, libertarians. I noticed in your introduction you mentioned a lot of Texans, Wallace Hall, Brenda P Pagevich, Charles Miller, Sarah Martinez Tucker. As far as I know, all these people support this Governor Abbott's plan called 60 by 30, which, you know, you know, your book documents well how the vast majority of jobs in the future will barely even require a high school diploma, and yet it's current public policy here in Texas, according to Gover Governor Abbott's plan, we are trying to increase by 50% the number of 25 to 34 year old Texans who have post-secondary degrees or certificates by the year 2030. It's like, have these folks read your book? I mean, I really don't see how anybody can read your book and not be a vehement oppose, opponent of 60 by 30. I have a feeling that if I were in the state that Governor Abbott and I would be having disagreements. Um, Brenda Pejevich, well, I don't want to speak for her, uh, and uh, Wallace Hall, both of whom I know, by the way, fairly well. I know Brenda Pavich quite well. I know Wallace Hall fairly well. Uh, I don't think they would be entirely in favor of what's going on now. I don't. Uh, Sarah Martinez Tucker maybe, uh, Margaret Spellingswood, Charles Miller. How? Um, this isn't the place to ask. Charles Miller, how's his health? Is he young? Passed away. Did he pass away? His health had been very poor for a while, so he, he's out of the picture now. No, a lot of the, it's true, Texas has had a lot of, we'll call them established, establishment Republicans that have sort of favored a modest modification of the status quo. Margaret Spellings I'd put in that category. Uh, and I don't think they went far enough. I don't think they were courageous enough. And they're, they're still kind of friends of mine, you know, I get along with people. I have Democrats who are friends. Um, so, uh, you know, I probably could be a friend of AOC if I had enough to drink. <laughs> <laughs> anyway, other questions? Other questions? Um, Go ahead, sir. Um, I was just wondering, in a typical market economy, you would usually have creditors, you know, looking at whether they would get paid or not, and it seems like the non-dischargeability and bankruptcy kind of messes up the, the economics of that. I'm just wondering if that's an issue you've looked at at all and how you would address it. I haven't spent a lot of time looking at that issue, but I think I'm inclined to agree with you. Uh, my instincts are that it doesn't make any particular sense to make a special exception for uh, uh, loans. I think kids who borrow to go to college ought to be treated like other borrowers. And that means in all respects. Some of them would be favorable for 
uh, the, uh, the lender and some would be favorable for the student, and I th think so. Uh, one, TPPF did something very w wise uh, a couple of months ago. They hired, uh, and uh, Dr. Lindsay gets the credit for this, a very bright guy who is now working for TPPF in Washington named Andrew Gillen. And uh, Tom, if I may make a modest suggestion, you might want to have Andrew write about that, or, or at least look into it. I think he would probably conclude that it doesn't, it, it kind of messes up the system. And uh, uh, on the other hand, all of this wave your hand and you get an exemption, or what, what are some of those terms they use? Uh, 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 it, people can get out of making their payments an awful lot easier. Forbearance. Uh, forbearance, thank you. Uh, forbearance, and, and I think some of this is unjustified. I think plus loans are unjustified. A huge part of our student loan debt, you know, for graduate students and uh, for people running up $100,000, $200,000 debt, what are there, 100 people with a million or more in debt? One million dollars or more. Uh, you know, how you do that, I don't know. What do you do? Uh, how do you run up a million dollars in debt? I don't know. A lot of it's interest payments that if, you know, people just haven't been making payments. And uh, these are doctors, and some of them are making 200,000 a year, but there's no way they can pay off a million dollars. So why don't we put some brakes on some of this stuff? Uh, why, what, do, it, does it really make sense to let a person get a PhD in almost anything when we have an overabundance of PhDs? And especially in a sort of a low life feel like sociology. Oh, I shouldn't have said that. <laughs> Strike that from the record. Uh, why do we allow it to happen? Uh, uh, it's one thing. I, I, to get a bachelor's degree, give people a loan for four years. Why do we let people borrow for seven years, eight years, nine years, ten years? It just, it, it, it makes no sense at all. I, I, as I say, I'd get government out of the business. Other questions? I've made a comment as a banker for 30 years. Yeah, good. A loan that you don't underwrite is a gift. Great. Yeah. That's part of the problem, the federal government, it's just a gift. Yeah, no, that's right. They, they don't have any sort of commercial standards at all. Uh, I mean, it's they don't look at it as a like a banker would. An asset. Yeah. One question I'd have is: Would you address core curriculum and the dilution of the quality of the courses? I I believe that our society has undergone a great deal of decline. Uh, in a civic sense, in part because of a decline in moral absolutes, in decline in uh, respect for such basic things as the Ten Commandments, as a decline in the fact that people do not share a common heritage that they recognize, a decline that's recognized when Jesse Waters asked people, uh, who was the f first president of the United States, and some of them say Abraham Lincoln, the, the better ones say Abraham Lincoln. Some of them are saying uh, George Bush, uh, instead of George Washington. When people don't know that, the, the glue that brings us together as Americans is a common identity, and to have a common identity, you need to know some history. You need to know a little bit of literature. You maybe need to know, have some training in, in, in let's call it Judeo-Christian uh, ethics. You need a little of this, and that ought to be part of the curriculum. And we've let that uh, curriculum uh, decline uh, at most universities in the United States. So there is indeed a curricular problem. I'm a sort of a traditional arts and sciences kind of guy, even though I teach economics, which is some people don't think in that conjunction. And the, my most favorite course from my years of college back, 
50 some years ago was a year course I took in French literature. And I took it in French. And I, to this day, I can barely read the French anymore, but I still think that was a great thing in my life. And I even like the French, <laughs> which is a failing of mine, I'll grant you, but <laughs> all right, I've gone too far. Other questions? Yes, sir. So, uh, you know, we talk a lot about like the metrics that we need to, to judge the effectiveness of, of whether or not the money's being spent properly, but it seems like at, at some point, you know, we're looking at colleges like they're a jobs program, and I don't think that was always the case. I mean, it's sort of a square peg in a round hole. I mean, at some point, when was it that universities began to be seen as effectively jobs programs as opposed to an, an actual higher education? And is that a problem? It, it's an absolute, what you say is true. Whether it's a problem or not, I suppose people of will differ in their opinions. But it's interesting, at the time of the American Revolution, one third of the college graduates in the United States, there were only nine colleges, colonial colleges. Most of the Ivies, uh, Rutgers, William and Mary, and uh, six of what are now Ivy League schools made up the colonial colleges. About one third of the graduates were, went into the ministry. And it was viewed that, that one of the main goals of college, and some would say the main goal of college, was to promote morality and virtue. That was the goal. As time went on, we took on other goals. And some people say part of it is to build this civic identity that we're talking about, this glue that makes us feel common to one another, that we're part of the same tribe, the American tribe. That is part of it. So there are many purposes of higher ed, and it's true as time has gone on, the vocational dimension got to emphasize more. A lot of people emphasize the Morale Act of the 19th century, the Land Grant Act, as being important. I think it's the most overrated piece of legislation that ever came down the pike. But uh, it is true that it put greater emphasis on uh, engineering and science and so forth. The National Defense Education Act of the 1950s did the same thing and we put more and more emphasis on we got to turn out, get more bang for our buck. Um, and uh, that has led in some cases I think to some sort of unhealthy vocationalism. Uh, you know I suspect Diminishing returns are setting in. I, I see some people are looking very pained. Uh, they're either tired or perhaps need to go to the bathroom or something. So, uh, but I'll keep talking. I mean, you know. Any any other questions? Go right ahead, sir. Uh, if you email the Hillsdale College, sends you a ton of information, uh, lectures. Uh, Use microphones. We're recording. Like this? If you email them, Hillsdale College sends you a lot of, uh, just a ton of information, uh, their coursework, uh, biographies of their lecturers, uh, and you mentioned it as a private school. What is your opinion of Hillsdale College? I love Hillsdale College. I go up there, well, I'm going up there this fall. I go up there at the invitation of students who ask me to come up and speak. Uh, it's one of the few truly private schools in the United States in that it can tell the government it will pay no attention to any of their rules. They don't have to at Hillsdale adhere to the uh, Civil Rights Act or the affirmative action. They, they, they are, have no connection whatsoever with the government. They, they do and they take people. They totally open to people of all different sorts of backgrounds, but it's, it's a marvelous place. Grove City College in Pennsylvania is very close to the same thing. They don't accept any government money and so on. Uh, I wish we had more schools like that. I, I think they're, uh, uh, you know, the, the great thing about American higher ed, the one great thing is the diversity of it all. 
we have 50 different, Justice Brandeis, who in many ways was an awful Supreme Court justice, but he said one wonderful thing in the early 1930s. He said, you know, America's a laboratory of democracy. We got 50, 50 different states doing 50 diff different things. So we have 50 different kinds of state governments, and even within state governments we have difference. Texas Tech is not the same thing as the University of Texas. I've, I've lectured on both campuses. Believe me, there's a difference. Uh, uh, and uh, 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 North Texas State, Dick Army and I used to, I used to kid Dick Army about North Texas State being, uh, you know, uh, well, I better not say, say what I said about North Texas State. But anyway, uh, no, that's the diversity of higher ed is what makes it cool. We have different ways. We have competition uh, in America. We, uh, and that is a strength, and we need to promote that strength rather than dilute that strength. The U.S. Department of Education should be put out of business. It was, it was created, it passed the committee, Tommy Chaplin's my legislative dude here, it passed the committee in the House of Representatives by a vote of 20 to 19 at a time when the Democrats had 280 seats in the House of Representatives, the Republicans had 150, almost two to one. The Democrats couldn't get it through the committee. It was opposed by the Washington Post. It was opposed by the New York Times. It was opposed by Senator Dan Daniel Patrick Monahan, the leading Democrat of the age intellectually. But it got through because Jimmy Carter wanted it through because it would help him in his 1980 election campaign. It didn't help him, but he thought it would uh, because the NEA, the National Education Association, wanted the Department of Education. That's how why we have a Department of Education. It has been a total disaster. All right, I better shut up. Well, listen, Rich, on behalf of the Foundation, I want to thank you for writing Restoring the Promise, and I want to thank you for coming here and talking about the book today. And we will have copies of the book available for purchase, and Rich will also be happy to sign them for you. Please join me in thanking Rich Fetter.